morning, man, my wife and I were excited. We're, we're ready to go because we're jumping into a brand new series uh, that we've entitled Chain Breaker. Right? You think about this concept of chains being broken. I don't know if you realize it or not, but uh, a number of years ago, there was this team that would travel to the United States, and they were called the Power Team. How many of you ever heard of the Power Team? Like, they'd rip phone books. They'd, they'd bend rebar over their neck. Well, Pastor Anthony and I, we used to travel with them. Uh, why are you laughing? I didn't say what we did. I just said we traveled with them. I didn't say, right? Don't, I'll tear a phone book at least a page and a half, all right? Uh, but, but there was this thing where, like, you, when you think about being a chain breaker, uh, if you've ever used anything with chain, if you're towing with chains, if you strap something down with chain, you don't want that chain to break, right? You want it to be as strong as it possibly could be. And so what happens in our life sometimes is we, get, we, we, we become captive by the chains that we carry. And we're like, okay, well, who's going to break these chains? Who's going to set me free from maybe the invisible prison or the physical prison that I find myself in? Whether that's worry, doubt, fear, anxiety, our past. And so the, over, this, over these next few weeks, we're just going to be unpacking. I mean, what's it look like for us to be able to experience having the chains broken in our lives? And this morning, man, we're ready to go. So if you have your app out, you got, so, you got your pen and paper ready, we're going to jump into what would it look like if God were to break the chains of our shame. Yeah, and as we dive in today, let's have a, mo a moment of truth. You guys ready for this? Raise your hand if you have ever been guilty of dropping food on the floor, blowing on it, and putting it in your mouth anyway. R nice and high. Yeah, because we know that when we like blow on it, it takes all the bacteria away, right? Guilty. Ra yeah. Raise your hand if you have ever lied trying to get out of a speeding ticket. Come on now, yeah, okay. I was like, some of you were like, I'm afraid to say this in church. Listen, God knows anyway, let's just be honest. All right, how many of you have ever been guilty of ignoring a phone call from a family member? Like, no, I ain't doing it. Like, Sorry, sorry ignore, Dad. <laughs> My <act> bad. <laughs> hit the red button. All right, for the teens in the room, oh, careful you, can, on the front you rows. can just do this, right? That way, you know, your parents don't see you. Raise your hand if you have ever pretended that your phone was dead so that you didn't have to answer your mom or your dad calling. Some of them are like, yeah. All right, we have adults in the room doing the same thing, okay? You're not alone. You're not alone. You learned it from somewhere. No. <laughs> All right, so raise your hand if you have ever been guilty of blaming something you did on a sibling. All you oldest children are the worst. I got the worst of that from my big brother. <laughs> I've done it too. We've all done it probably. If you have a sibling, you know you've done it. Uh, we've all been guilty though of making mistakes in our lives. But guilt is different than shame. Guilt is very different from shame. Guilt is action-based and shame is identity-based. So guilt believes I did something bad. But shame believes I am bad. And there's the difference, and we're going to talk about that today. We feel guilty about what we did, but we feel shame over who we are. And this started way back in Genesis chapter 2, and that's where we're going to start with our portion of Scripture today, because the world was perfect. Everything was all as it should be, and God laid out this beautiful plan of creation. And in this time we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked. And they felt no shame. And so in the story of creation, as we read the account of it, we can see that God has created the perfect place. Perfect place for him and his children to dwell. He's describing in his word the trees and the animals, the perfection and the cool of the day that they walked in and the perfect weather. And it's important to note that it wasn't just perfect in what he created. It wasn't just perfect with the this is what I did, and it's beautiful, and it's lovely. It's intentional that it continues on and says, they were both naked, and they had no shame. Because the description of paradise ultimately means that there is no shame, and there is no condemnation. And we can't just talk about creation without recognizing that in the fullness of what God created, it was perfect because there was no shame. And so what do we see? We see Adam and Eve now doing what? Hiding. Right? All of a sudden it's like, oh, we made, this, we made this mistake. We chose to eat and we shouldn't have. And now I see you, you see me, ha, ah, right? And there's some shame. And so they go hiding. They cover themselves and hide. And I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what you're hiding from this morning, but we probably all hide at some point. Whether that's from uh, 
past poor decisions with our finances and we find ourselves strapped with debt. Maybe that's with a, a sexual past or maybe that's with addiction or maybe that's, maybe that's even with something that you did years or decades ago or something that was done to you. And so now all of a sudden we have this, we have this shame. We have these, these deep secrets and, and we're struggling because, because we know what we looked at and we know what we shouldn't have looked at. We know what we said, we know what we shouldn't have said, we know what we did, we know what we shouldn't have done. And now we have all these feelings that are running wild in, inside our minds and, and we're thinking to ourselves things like, man, maybe I'm defective, maybe I'm damaged, maybe, maybe I'm broken, I'm flawed. And we feel dirty, we feel ugly, we feel impure, maybe even disgusting. And it's in those moments where, where the enemy of our souls comes and he whispers in our ears. And then we, we struggle with having an identity crisis because we feel like th- this, this voice that we're hearing says that, we're unlovable, that we're weak, that we're pitiful, that no one would ever want to have us in their lives, that our lives are insignificant and without meaning, and we're not worthy, and we find ourselves unwanted. And so it's in those moments, then, what do we do is we, we want to run, and we want to hide, and we want to get away from it. We even choose sometimes to numb it, even though in our minds and in, in our hearts we know that by numbing it, it's only temporary, that this shame is going to come back. And yet we make these choices, but here's the problem. Shame will have you running when no one is chasing. Did you hear me on that? Shame will have you running when no one is chasing. Adam and Eve, God just wanted to have a conversation. Where are you at? And they find themselves running. Because of the choice, what do they do? They run and hide. Moses, right? the, the leader, he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. But if you read his story, what's he do? He commits murder, and then what's he do? He takes off running until God speaks to him through a bush that's on fire, yet it's not consumed. Why shame? And I can't believe what I've done. And now I need to go and run and hide from it. And then we see David who commits adultery. And then what's he do? He has to go cover that up. And he, 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 takes, he takes the husband of the wife and he says, listen, I'm gonna, I need to have him murdered because of the shame. And we see Judas even himself and his betrayal of Jesus. It leads him through his shame to his own self-destruction because we run even though no one is chasing. We hide even though no one is looking. Imagine playing hide and seek by yourself. That's what we do. It's like, I'm going to go hide, but no one's coming to find me. That's what we do with shame. We go hide, and we don't want anybody to know. We don't want anybody to see into maybe what we've done or, or things that we've said or even into our past. You see, hiding is, is, it tends to tie us to our past. Right? We're living in the present, but we're stuck in the past. Right, because we feel like even last week, how I mentioned, we, spinning your wheels. Like we're spinning our wheels. We're not, having, we're not getting any traction. We're just stuck, even though life seems to be moving forward. Because shame, what does shame do? It takes us to these deep, dark places. And we just want to escape from it. And here's what I know. The enemy loves to fight his battles in the dark. But here's what I know to be even more true. That we have a Savior that loves to bring them and fight them in the light. Right? And so, so shame is so powerful. We see it, we see it in Scripture. In Jesus' first miracle, we look at it and we're like, we celebrate it, we talk about it. It's like, look, look at what Jesus did. He showed up on the scenes. He went to a wedding. Right? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? Right, Leroy Abbey, like you're just having your wedding and then Jesus shows up and he's like, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? Right? He'll be there if you invite him, but maybe not in physical. He said right? my dad. That's his dad's Right, yeah. Jesus. Jesus will be there too, hopefully. Um, don't do anything wrong. Okay? And they may, no. But, but here's the deal. Jesus shows up. And now there's, there's an issue at the wedding where they're, where they're running out of wine. And Jesus says, well, what do we have? Well, we got some water. And he turns that water into wine. And you're like, well, what's the significance of that? What does that have anything to do with shame? In biblical times, the bridegroom would provide the wine. If he were to run out of wine, that was a disgrace to him and to his family. He would bear the shame because what that meant was, hey, you're getting married, but you'll never be able to take care. You'll never be able to provide for your bride. And so now he would experience shame like never before because he didn't plan out. He didn't provide. And now Jesus is still continuing to, to do that for us today, isn't he? Right? We are his bride. We are, we are his, his prized possession. And he is continually showing up in miraculous ways so we don't have to experience and live in this shame. And so we need to be careful when we're walking through this, this shame because what I know is, is shame is powerful. But here's what I also know. That so is his grace. Right? Shame is so powerful, but so is his grace. Yeah, and we know from scripture that grace not only saves us, but it sustains us. 
So we, we see this in the story of the prodigal son, and that's found in Luke chapter 15. We're going to get there in just a few moments. But I'm just going to recap this story in case you're unfamiliar with it. So there's this, like, spoiled brat rich kid, right? This is, this is just facts right now, who decides that he wants to take his inheritance, live as though his father is dead. And so he takes his money from his father, and he runs off, and he spends all his money on wild living. Some of the scripture, or some scripture translation says he spends it all on prostitutes and parties, and he just squanders his father's inheritance. He runs off until he ends up in a place where he is just filled with shame, he is eating with pigs. And what we need to keep in mind is that it wasn't just like eating with pigs like I'm starving. It wasn't just I could do better at my father's house, the slaves eat better. But the significance in this is that in the Jewish culture, pigs were considered unclean. So not only was he starving, not only did he blow all his money, but now he has done the thing that ultimately needs to separate him from society and the people who truly love the Lord. What a place to find yourself in. And so this prodigal son is there, and in, it, it says in Scripture that he comes to his senses. Have you guys ever came to your senses before where you're like, what in the world am I doing? Or why am I arguing about this dumb thing? Or fill in the blank of wherever you've been when you're like, this is dumb. So this is where he's at. He's eating with the pigs. He realizes this is not working out for me. I am in a horrible place. It would be better if I go back to my father and so he sets off to go back that way. Now, what we need to understand is what the law says. So when we know the story of the prodigal son, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, what we need to keep in mind is he wasn't expecting what happened. So in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18, would have been the law that this young man lived under. And this is what it says. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. In such case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and fuses to obey. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Aren't we glad that we don't do this anymore? Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you, and all of Israel will hear about it and be afraid. According to the law that this young man lived under, him returning home, he faced death. He faced his entire community shunning him, stoning him. And here's the beauty in the story is we can see that in Luke chapter 15, verse 20, this is the freedom of what happens when grace sustains us and it saves us. This is the power of grace. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned both against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick. He didn't say, wait a few minutes. Let me talk to you for 30 or 40 minutes about all the things you had done wrong. You know, let's spend some time really addressing how bad you've been. His response was quick. Right now, go immediately. Don't delay. Get to it. Bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost but is found, so let the party begin. So grace not only saves us, but it sustains us, and here's why. Because grace cancels shame. Grace cancels shame. The prodigal son gives us a model. Right? It gives us a, a perfect example of, man, how do we handle this shame in our lives? What, what do we do? How do we see the chains of this shame broken in our lives? And here's what he did. He recognizes his sin. And then he begins to confess it. But you can have confession without repentance. He does something about it. He, he speaks about it, unburies it from his life, and then says, man, something has to change. I need to go back to whom? The Father. And so are we willing to confess it, or do we, do we find ourselves sometimes burying it? Because here's what happens when we bury it, it grows. Right? Oh, I don't want, I'm not going to deal with this, and I'm just going to store it away, and no one ever has to know. It grows. It may not grow where anybody else is going to see it, but it grows within our heart within our spirits, within our souls. And we can deal with it now or we can deal with it later, but later will always cost you more, right? right? It, it will begin to, to distract you, detour you from your calling and your purposes. And so what do we do? We have to confess it. By confessing it, what are we doing? We're digging it up. 
Do you know that freedom happens when we understand the weight of his love? Right? Freedom happens when we understand the weight of his love. But understanding the, the weight of his love, understand this, it happens when we fully understand the weight of our sin. Right? You want to you wanna be willing to embrace all of the love that he has for me, like 1 Corinthians 13 type of love? Then we have to understand the weight of our sin, the weight that he had to carry. Right? Think about it for a moment. It would be like saying the shame that we carry is like putting another human on our back. And what do we do? We want, we want to manage life and we want to walk through life, but we're carrying an extra person everywhere we go. And Jesus comes along and says, listen, I don't need you to carry that. I'm, I'm going to carry it for you with the cross. And it's something you should never have to carry. And then all of a sudden we get to experience him and find that he can, he can break those chains of our, our, of our shame so that when we're walking, we're not carrying it with us. We're able to have the freedom, but we have that freedom because we understand the weight of his love. And so we have to call it out. we got to remove its power. We can't keep it to ourselves. The enemy, the enemy wants us to keep it to ourselves. The enemy doesn't want you to speak about it. The enemy doesn't, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. You just keep doing whatever it is you're doing. No, 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 no. Be willing to confess it. Be willing to bring it out. Be willing to, to say what it is. Don't give the enemy that, that foothold, but be willing to allow the chains to be broken. Yeah. Bringing shame to light is the beginning of restoration. So you want to figure out, like, how do I break this power of shame in my life? Can I give you the first step to that? Don't hide in it. Don't hide in your shame. Don't let the enemy whisper to you in those dark places all by yourself because there's power when we bring the truth to the light, no matter how bad the truth might be. The son headed home. And the Bible tells us that while he was a long way off, his father was waiting for him. And I need you to think about that. The father saw him from a distance. He didn't wait until he was right there, till he had walked up close. He didn't wait till he begged. It says while he was a long way off, his father was looking for him. And he began running to him, which is also significant because men of his prominence did not run in that day. So not only is my son coming back, who is full of shame, who according to the law deserves death and to be publicly humiliated and stoned, but now I'm not only going to recognize that that's my son whom I love, but I'm going to run towards him. I'm going to take every ounce of energy and passion that I have and run towards my child. And he covers him with his robe. He's basically saying, I'm going to cover you with my own righteousness. You might have not done it right, but I'm going to cover you with my robe and I'm going to put some sandals on your feet so that you know you're no longer walking in sin, but you're walking as my son and you get that ring. I'm going to signify that you are a part of my family and that has not changed and that will not change and you are mine and I love you and I'm going to throw you a party. I don't care that you spent yours, all your money on prostitutes and partying and living a wild life. I'm going to throw you a party and a celebration to remind you what real celebration celebration is. It's the return of a father and a son being united. The father had so much more for him, even though he would have been enough. It would have been enough for the son to come home as he laid there and he came to his senses. He had said, it'd be better if I'm just a, a slave in my father's house. That's what I'm going to beg him for. I will fall to my knees and beg him just to be a slave with him because I'd have it better. And so the son comes in thinking, my daddy is enough. It's enough to be in his presence. It's enough to just know that I am provided for and taken care of. But the father wanted to give him more. And friends, can I let you know that while you're a long way off, while you're struggling, while you're sitting alone in your shame, the father is calling out to you saying, I want to give you more. It's not just enough that you're my child. I want to celebrate and live life and life to the full with you. So not only does grace save us and sustain us, but the second thing is this, is grace redefines you from failure to family. Let that sink in for a moment. It redefines you. It gives you an identity from, from failure to family. I love the consistency of the grace of Jesus all throughout the scripture that we get to see. Right? I love that, that he never changes, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. From, from the woman at the well to his, one of his very own friends, Peter. Right? We, speak, we speak about Peter, and we know he's, he's a disciple of Jesus. He's following after Jesus, and, and now there's this conversation that's going to take place where Jesus says, listen, it's going to be my darkest moment, and you're going to deny me. I'm, I'm going to be willing to take on the sins of the world, and you're going to deny me with some junior high kids because you're going you're to you're have this fear. 
And so all of a sudden there's this moment where Pete, surely enough, it happens where, where it's like, hey, are you friends with Jesus? And he's like, no, 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 I don't even know who this guy is. What are you talking about? And so Peter finds himself denying Jesus. But he told Jesus, listen, Jesus, I got your back. I'm not going to bail on you. I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not going to be like those guys. Listen, I'll support you. I'm going to be here. And it's in that moment where Peter fails. Jesus pays the price at Calvary. He gives his life. And then three days later, in just a few short weeks, we'll celebrate the resurrection, Easter. And so now there's a, a resurrected Jesus, and he's, he's going to appear to his friends multiple times. And there's this moment in John chapter 21 where uh, he wants to give them some advice about fishing. Right? He's going to tell the fishermen how to fish. And so he's, he's like, hey, listen, why don't you throw your nets on the other side? And then they have all this fish, and it's, it's so great, and there's this, this big moment, right? And while they're out fishing, while they're doing what they're doing, Jesus says, listen, I'm, I'm going to do something for these guys when they come in. Now, this is a resurrected Jesus. I don't, this doesn't seem like this is the most important thing to do in the moment, but I think it, it probably is the most important thing because that's what he did. It's significant, and you'll see why. So he says, hey, listen, while they're out there and they're fishing, I'm going to make a fire, and uh, I'm going to cook breakfast. Right, the disciples are fishing, but I'm going to cook some breakfast. And here's, here's what happens. They come on in, and now there's this moment where he's, he's, he invites them, hey guys, why don't you come have a seat? Why don't you come have a seat at this table? I've prepared some food. We're going to eat some breakfast. We've got, you know, whatever Jesus would have prepared, probably fish, because um, that was what was there in front of him in the water. And now all of a sudden, he's at the table. Now at this table, you think, hey man, he's going to have a conversation. Well, who's he want to talk to? Peter, why don't you come on over? Oh boy, right? Was this a, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Just a few days ago, I denied Jesus. Now Jesus is saying, hey, come on. And now we're at the table and there's other people at the table. And if Jesus was going to talk to me, wouldn't he have talked to me in private? If he was going to scold me for what I've done, wouldn't he have, and he's going to give me shame, wouldn't he have done it in private? And now there's this public moment. And you would think at the table, the conversation may start something like this. Hey, Peter, how's it going? How you doing? Do you know what you did? Why don't you tell everybody else what you did? Do you feel sorry for what you've done, Peter? Have you, uh, for real? I mean, I told you it was going to happen, and you still did it anyway. Why are you such a failure? Why did you make those decisions? What was going through your mind, Peter? Right, isn't that, isn't that what Jesus should have done? Isn't that what he should have said? He didn't say that. You see, this is a moment of restoration for Peter. This is, this is a moment, and you think, well, if you're going to restore, you've got you to know what you've done wrong first. He doesn't. He asks Peter a very important question. He has him come up to the table, and then he has a conversation with him, and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? What's he saying? Do you love me more than, than everything else? Do you love me more than the fish that you're out there catching? Do you love me more than the, the, than the very breath that is in your life sustaining you? And Peter says, yes, Lord. And then Jesus gives him this challenge, and this is why this is such a significant moment. He says, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And he has this, he, right, and you're like, what, what's he doing with Peter? He's restoring Peter. He says, feed my sheep. What's he saying? Listen, take care of those. Preach the gospel. Peter, I'm going to use you as the rock, as a foundation to build the church that will change the history of the world. So Peter, I need to have this moment with you of restoration, you see, just like Peter, and, just, and it's the same for you and I, what did Jesus do? Jesus brought him to the table, not to interrogate him, but to restore him. He wants you to come to his table, not so he can interrogate you and talk about all the shame in your life, but so he can restore you with his love and with his grace and with his mercy. He's just wanting to know if we'll come and have a seat with him. So are you willing to have a seat at the table with Jesus this morning? Because I believe Jesus is saying, I know what you've done. I know what was done to you. I know you're already reliving it over and over and over again in your head. I don't need to ask you that. I know. But that's not who you are. What was done to you is not who you are. What you have done is not who you are. The same way he says to Peter, you're going to be a legend. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my church on you. I believe that he would be here today saying, son, daughter, your story isn't over yet. I am working it out. I've got a plan. You are not so great that you can ruin my plans for your life. I am still the Lord Almighty. 
I am still the God who formed you and created you. And you might be here saying, I can't let myself off the hook. Great. That's not your job to do anyway. It was never your job to let yourself off the hook. That's his job and only his job. And he's the only one can, that can do that. He's the only one that can do it and truly remove it and take it away. Psalms 34 says this, those who look to the Lord are radiant. Those who look to the Lord are radiant. What a powerful picture, isn't that? So then it's no wonder why the enemy constantly has us looking to our sin and our shame. Last thing he wants is for us to be looking radiant, walking in the image of the Lord, walking in the power of who we are in Christ. And so we're looking to ourselves, we're looking to our sin, we're looking to our shame, and therefore not looking to the Lord who makes us radiant. But what we can do is we could humble ourselves. We could say that if Jesus Christ said it, the Savior of the world, then I believe it then it's not my word. It's not me saying I'm not going to let me off the hook. It's I'm going to bow and I'm going to surrender and I'm going to see myself and I'm going to see those around me in the light of who Christ is in his glory and in his honor. If he says it, I believe it. If he says I'm forgiven, then I'm forgiven. If he says I'm healed, then I'm healed. If he says I'm whole, then I'm whole. If he says that he let me off the hook, then I have been let off the hook. If he says that I am made in his image, then I look like Jesus Christ, baby. That's what it's about. It's his word over mine. It's who he is over and in and through who I am. The only way to heal from shame is to move our focus from what I am not to who Christ is. Because it is not about us. It is not about you. It is not about me. It is not about your worst moments. It's not about the things that you keep reliving in your mind over and over and over again. It's not about the things that you can't get past that you look at and you continually let yourself down and, and live in your worst moments. It's about looking to Christ, believing who he is and what he did. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him. And I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Friends, the joy before him was a relationship with you. The joy before him was making you whole. The joy before him was removing your shame. The joy before him was giving you life and life to the fullest. Abundant life, peace and joy, love and hope, prosperity. Those are things found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And that's the joy that was set before him. So in doing that, he, Jesus, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ broke the chain of shame. He broke it all by himself. He endured the cross. He was hated. In scorning a shame, what does that mean? It means that scorning means that it no longer had worth. There was no value anymore in shame. It could not have any value or control or weight in your life. And he took it and he scorned it and he, we are now worth everything in the light of Jesus Christ. Because he wants to bring us home to the city of God. And he wants us to live in his presence and in his Holy Spirit and the power of God right now. In our worst moments and in our best moments. When we do a great job and when we just completely get it wrong. In every moment, in every season, he is there for us. Wanting us to have a seat at the table just like he did with Peter. There's a reason he didn't sit there and scold him. We know we know when we did wrong. We know when we've misbehaved. We know when we're guilty. Friends, can I tell you the thing that frustrates me the most about the church of Jesus Christ? Yes, I said that. We think it's enough that Jesus removed our sin, and we rest in that. But the scripture doesn't stop there. Why is it okay for Christians to walk around living in shame? It says that he took our sin and our shame. It's both and. It's not one or the other. The same way that we believe that he died for our sins, that he, he bore stripes on his back for our healing, he scorned shame once and for all for you and for me so that we could walk free according to the image of Christ that he has called us to walk in. He knows we've been agonizing it, but can I just, friends, can I, can I just have a, a moment with you? I believe he's calling us to the table 
to say it's time to stop agonizing. It's five years ago. It's 40 years ago. It was yesterday. You're my child, and I love you, and I'm running towards you, and I want a relationship with you. And the worthless way that you're feeling, that you're feeling is not from me. It's from the enemy. And in your worst moments, I love you just the same. And I'm going to pursue you, and I'm going to call you back home, and I'm going to wrap you in my robe and put my ring on your finger and my sandals on your feet. And I'm not going to let you go because you're too valuable. So it, I believe if he was here today, he might be saying something like this. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than you hate yourself? Because I do. And when I was hanging on that cross, I saw you and I bore that weight so you don't have to. Let it go. Let me carry your burden. Let me lift this weight you don't have to do this on your own anymore because I set you free from that. And that's what he does, friends. We're going to spend the next couple weeks talking about the chains in our life. And I mean it. As a church, big church, the church of Jesus, why do we think it's okay to sit around in our shame as though that's the best life Christ has for us. Did he, did he forgive you? Does he love you? Has he called you chosen? Has he set you apart? Did he say you get one shot and you're done? Nope. He told Peter he was going to do something wrong three times. Peter did it, still showed up after the resurrection and said, you're going to be a legend. You're mine. Let's go. I'm building my church on you. You're going to lead thousands to Jesus. Get up. Wipe the dust off your knees. We're not, we're not done with this thing. And whatever you came in with and whatever you're carrying, Christ is enough. He's enough. Many of you have come from church backgrounds where the only way to, to experience forgiveness is to cry for three hours at an altar begging God for forgiveness. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with crying in the presence of the Lord. Hear my heart. Christ forgave you once and for all. Once and for all. And if you want to cry and spend some time with the Lord repenting, that's beautiful. But that is not what saves us. What saves us is the power of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ washing over our lives, and that when we look to him, we become radiant, and that's it. It's that simple. We walk and we live in his love. And so today we're going to end a little different. Each of you received a note card on your way in. You have heard story after story in your mind. You have relived over and over and over again your worst moments. The things that you wish you could take away, get a do-over, the things that, ugh, that shame. It's time to give it to Jesus. It's time to focus on who he is, not what we've done because who he is is alive in us and we are made in his image. So we're going to take these next few moments as Bree sings the lyrics to this song. Write down who Jesus says you are. Write down the truth of his word over you. And if you leave today and you're still having a hard time believing it, put it on your mirror, put it on your dashboard in your car. Sometimes it takes seeing it. Tell a friend, this is where I'm struggling. But in these next few moments, let the word of God speak to your heart. Remind yourself who he is because who he is is in you. That is who you are.